Welcome to Simple Entomology for the Fly Tire and Fly Fisherman, Part 4. I'm Raj Kletke, and today we'll be discussing the sow bugs and scuds. Okay, some of you caught me. Technically, entomology is the study of the class insects. Sow bugs and scuds are in a different class, crustacea. Nevertheless, sow bugs and scuds are too important to the fly fishermen to ignore. So today, let's go outside of entomology and look at sow bugs and scuds. Perhaps our beetle, ant, or grasshopper were not as effective as you wanted, or perhaps you just want to fish subsurface. To know the best fly to put on, you would like to know what organisms the fish are seeing in the drift and at what level they are seeing these organisms. Sampling the drift may be helpful if the fish are feeding selectively, but is of minimal value if the fish are feeding only opportunistically. What other clues are there as to the correct fly to put on? Did you see any green plants in the water you've been fishing? Green plants are very obvious in this particular stream. Did you notice any water crust growing on the banks and extending into the water? Remember that the other name for a sow bug is a crust bug. But whether there is water crust in the stream bed or only other green plants, the presence of green plants in a stream usually implies a high nutrient stream and a relatively shallow stream so that sunlight can get to the stream bed, allowing photosynthesis and growth of the plants. While a rapids will scour the aquatic vegetation, many streams have gentle flows, at least in portions, that allow aquatic vegetation to grow and therefore will usually have sow bugs and scuds. Pick up a handful of the aquatic vegetation and wait for a few minutes to see if sow bugs and scuds wiggle out. So what are sow bugs and scuds? Both are crustacea. This is a sow bug, which is also known as a crust bug. This is also a sow bug. This is a scud. Note that both have a segmented hard back shell and numerous jointed legs. There are similarities and differences between the two organisms. Morphologically, sow bugs tend to be flattened vertically, while scuds tend to be flattened from side to side. While sow bugs and scuds are present in great numbers in behavioral drift, a topic we'll discuss in future videos, almost never are trout feeding selectively on sow bugs or scuds. This greatly simplifies choosing a fly. So what size fly should we tie? Like other organisms with exoskeletons, sow bugs and scuds outgrow their shell and need to molt or shed their shell to get larger. The stages between molting are known as instars. Unlike some of the organisms that we'll talk about in future videos that have a somewhat coordinated growth pattern, the sow bugs and scuds are not coordinated as a species, and therefore at any given time there will be instars of varying sizes. I usually tie a size 14 as this is large enough to attract trout from a distance, and while it may be slightly larger than average, still is a size that trout frequently see. And yes, I did fudge this sow bug growth chart by simply enlarging the same picture multiple times. However, the concept is correct. Out of the water, scuds tend to curl up into the C shape. However, in the water, both scuds and sow bugs tend to be straight. I tie them on straight hooks, not on scud hooks. Cell bugs and scuds are different organisms, but trout are usually feeding opportunistically on them, and while there are likely exceptions, usually one fly pattern is all you need for either organism. I've caught many trout on this classic scud pattern, a pattern that can be found on the internet and in numerous fly tying books. Except for shape, it fulfills Hewitt's factors quite well. Obviously, the same pattern can be tied on a straight hook. However, there's a simpler pattern that I like even better. So, let's tie that pattern. Cell bugs and scuds may be dislodged from the vegetation at any level, and you may have to fish channels between aquatic vegetation, but generally I like to weight my flies so they fish near the bottom. 
While the pontoon method of attaching weight may be better, I still prefer to wrap my wire around the hook. You'll note that I'm using an old bobbin that cut thread, but works great for cutting the wire. I counterwind my wire so that the thread binds the end of the wire near the bend of the hook easily. Once the wire is in place, I take orange, salmon, or pink thread and start it in the usual fashion near the eye of the hook and then tightly bind the wire into place. I do like some longitudinal thread to help hold the wire in place. I then fairly thoroughly cover the wire, although this doesn't have to be entirely complete. Once that's done, I can cut off the excess thread if it doesn't break easily. And then using my debarbing pliers, I'll flatten the wire to give a little bit of a vertical flattening to the fly. Note that if we ignore the hook like we hope fish do, vertical flattening becomes the same as side flattening if we rotate the hook 90 degrees. This fly is tied almost in the round and I don't think that orientation is critical. I'll then go back and make sure that the rest of the wire is covered with thread as necessary. Once this is completed, I'll put on what looks like a tail, but is actually the antenna of the scud. I use a barred feather here, holding it on the near side and using thread tension to take it to the top of the hook. I bind it in place and then clip the excess. After dampening the thread with water, I'm ready to apply dubbing. Be sure to leave the guard hairs in any dubbing that you make or get dubbing with guard hairs in. You want it very spiky. I apply it very loosely to this thread. If I wanted it any looser, I'd have to use a dubbing loop. I'm using gray dubbing here, which is the most common color I use, but a dark olive or a dark olive gray would also be an excellent choice. Color hasn't seemed to be a large issue for me. After I apply it to the thread, I often start it as seen in my series on rotary vices, and then I can control the thickness and tightness of the dubbing very well while I use the rotary vise to wrap the dubbing onto the hook shank. At the end of the hook shank, I adjust the dubbing as necessary for it to finish up the way I want it to be. Often I'll remove any excess Whoops, in this case I removed a little too much, so I'll add a little more dubbing. Now I finish the head of the fly, which is actually the tail of a scud. Once that's done, I can put my normal little head of thread on and use the whip finisher in the usual fashion. Again, as those who have followed my videos see, I usually put three wraps on the first one to get the thread under control, and then add a second whip finish so that I don't have to use head cement. The thread can then be trimmed, and this is the completed fly that serves both as a scud and a crest bug. Note how spiky it is. If yours isn't this spiky, use your dubbing needle to pick spikiness out. 
It doesn't show up well here, but after wetting the fly, you should be able to see the thread color through the loose dubbing. This is the effect you want. Cell bugs are quite helpless in the current and therefore should be fished dead drift. They may move their legs a little and the spikiness of the fly should cause that micro movement. Scuds, on the other hand, swim forward using their legs and can swim rapidly back using their tail like a crayfish. Therefore, when fishing a scud pattern, it can be used either dead drift or even on a wet fly swing. Before ending this video, I want to thank Troutnut.com, which allows others to use photos from their website. Incidentally, if you have an interest in entomology for the fly fishermen, you should definitely check this site out. What group of organisms is reasonable to fish with almost any time of year, almost any time of day, and on almost any stream, or for that matter of fact, lake you might be fishing? We'll discuss that group of organisms in the next video, Simple Entomology for the Fly Tire and Fly Fisherman, Part 5. See you soon.